Thank you. Uh, when we began planning this conference, we wanted to cover an array of rising threats to our country, our national security, and our freedom. Uh, but we also wanted to cover the upside, not just gloom and doom. Uh, what are some of the promising signs, the good things? And on that upbeat note, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Susan M. Gordon. I I'm told she likes to go by Sue. And quite simply, the good news, piece of good news is she's on our side, okay? She has devoted her career to the security of this country. Uh, Sue joined the CIA in 1980 during the Cold War. She served at the CIA for some 27 years, rising to senior executive positions in each of its four directorates, operations, analysis, science and technology, and support. Uh, from 2015 to 2017, she served as deputy director of the National Geospace Intelligence Agency, which I would consider a full career in itself. Uh, last year, President Trump nominated her for her current post, Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. Uh, she was sworn in on August 7th, 2017, and since then has been assisting the Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, in leading America's intelligence community. Sue Gordon is widely respected for her talents at innovation and teamwork, a skill she was already uh, honing in her college days as captain of the Duke University women's basketball team. And those of you who can't resist doing the math will notice a gap in her years with the intelligence community. That gap is accounted for by another of her stellar achievements. She's a mother of two, both of them now adults, both of whom have chosen, like their parents, to serve their country. Thank you. Sue, I'd like to start off, I want to ask you a little bit about yourself, sure. just to introduce you to the audience more, more thoroughly, but uh, with a question about being a, an international spy master, if I may. A woman of mystery. A woman of mystery, yes. <laughs> Is it anything like the spy movies that we see on TV? Have you had any of those cliffhanger moments? Um, so. Uh, what I'm fond of saying is if you want to know CIA officers in a Tom Clancy movie, they're the ones laughing. Um, I, think, I think in some of the capabilities you see, um, you would say that the movies um, don't have it right, um, but actually the work is far more challenging, far more intriguing, far more complex, and far more consequential than any of the things you see. Um, probably the most... Uh, <laughs> um, intriguing experience of my career was in the early 80s I was a young uh, uh, technical analyst of uh, Soviet, that's how old I am, uh, Soviet weapon systems and there was a piece of paper on a desk that says we need technical people to do something cool. Um, and I'm like, I'm technical and who wouldn't want to do something cool? Uh, and so I was selected to be part of a small four-person team that went over to the um, former Soviet Union to inspect the newly built, um, or in process of being built, um, American embassy in Moscow. And it didn't have any walls. Um, all it had was pillar to, pillars. And so they taught us how to um, rope climb so we could go up and down the building and sense the walls to find out if it was bugged. It was. Um, and it was very Soviet Union. Um, we'd stayed in a hotel. We worked at night. We would walk behind the um, RSFSR building, like the Soviet parliament. Um, do you remember Yeltsin when he was in the tank? Yeah, that big white building. So we would walk behind that building to go to the embassy to, to check it out at night. When we would walk by it, they'd turn off the street lights. <laughs> You know, Zills would come driving by and screech and look at us. People would stop. I mean, it was, they'd, they'd rifle through our rooms when we were, we were out of it. But um, we, um, I remember in 83, um, it was, you, you imagine the Soviet Union as this huge power, and yet when you were in Moscow, um, little women would go into the, open air markets and pick out the best bundles of sticks to tie to their brooms to sweep. I mean, just the juxtaposition between a huge military power and just desperate conditions um, for the people there. And you knew the fall was coming. It was really interesting. Uh, thank you. Actually, that does sound like the spy movies. It was. It was um, great. 
<laughs> and how did you get into this? You were you studied zoology. Yeah, perfect discipline, right? Makes so, infinite sense. You're like, <laughs> of course you did. Of course you did. <laughs> what led you to the CIA? Uh, so um, I was going to be a world famous aquanaut. Uh, if you're in my generation, Jacques Cousteau was the big thing, and everyone in my generation wanted to be a marine biologist. So I started looking for schools um, that that did that, and um, uh, the, the combination school I identified was Duke University, and they had a marine sci science consortium on the East Coast where you could spring, spend spring semesters. I thought this was perfect. Duke, big name, sports programs, and I can be a marine biologist. It turned out I played basketball, so I never could go um, out on the East Coast, and I just chose a different major, zoology. Um, um, to study. I thought I either wanted to go into PhD work um, or be a lawyer, um, but if you can't decide that, you ought to get a job. And CIA came to visit the campus, and my dad was career Navy, so public service was, was in my heart, and so I thought, I'll go see what they're doing. And it was interesting. They, um, they were great purpose, and they were about great achievement, and there was an uncertainty to intelligence that kind of matched the uncertainty in the biological sciences. So I got hired to do analysis of Soviet biological warfare. So that makes sense, right? Zoology, biological warfare. Yeah, except the job was gone when I got there and I had to wander around the building finding something else to do. And all I could find was doing weapons analysis. And I thought, ah, well, I can, I can do that. Um, yeah, I know. Really and truly, if you are committed to lifelong learning, you can do almost anything if you keep on doing it. But actually, I sold them because I said mechanical engineering um, was just applied zoology. And I think they either decided I was smart or dangerous, and they let me do it. Um, so it, it's just, you know, I, I tell a story now that zoology is a great background for intelligence analysis. And, and here's why. You're going to believe me in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> really, you Claudia. Will. Well, okay. here it goes. Um, when you're looking at living systems, you have to assume that what they're doing, they're doing perfectly, right? Evolution says that they improve in reproductive fitness and they're very good. And so you don't judge the quality of what they're doing, you're judging what they're doing. In intelligence, it's the same thing. <laughs> do, you know what, do you know what this is? It's a test. Are you responsible for this? No, but, <laughs> but um, I, I think it's almost as a, um, annoying a sound as the emergency broadcast system on the TV at 4 in the morning. Uh, no, but I think, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute. Let's go, we'll get back to talking about kind of world threats and reality. And I think, I think the most interesting thing in a digitally connected world is what's obvious now is National security isn't confined to government entities. It really is a whole of country thing. And so I think, I think when you have alerts like that, you're just saying that, that we're all part of the same whole. Well, I'm actually, an optimist. This relates to, I wanted to, as you were coming up, naturally you had uh, enormous computing power at your disposal in analyzing <laughs> Soviet missiles. Uh, you got on your iPhone and used our look down satellites and- So and no desktop computers when I started at the agency. Um, I did technical analysis with a thing called a Gerber scale, which is just, um, raise your hand if you know what a slide rule is, right, pre-computers. <laughs> Yay, I'm in my demographic group. Well, a Gerber scale is just a variable scale ruler, and um, instead of using computers to analyze the signals that came off of satellites, um, they would print out long pieces of paper with squiggles, and then we would use manually measuring the heights of all of them and go through it as a, you know, it was probably five years into my job before we had computers to do that work. Um, the great news about it is, and it is something I worry about, is I had to learn the discipline of technical analysis before I had computers to help me with it. Now we've gone through an era where people can almost become botanologists letting the computers do the work. And as we move into an era of artificial intelligence, which we must do because there's so much data that we need machines to be our partners, what's going to come back in vogue is the critical thinking because it then will be back around to 
what the humans make of it rather than just what the machine produces. So it's an interesting arc from the start of my career to now this moment we see. Let me ask you a little bit about what's sort of how things have changed. When you were doing this, it was the Cold War, the Soviet Union was the big yep. threat. There were some others around it, yep. but uh, today, um, what are we actually looking at in the way of threats? Where, where do you begin? Yeah, I am. Um, so you say, well, when I started, I was in an office called the Office of Scientific and Weapons Research, and we had 780 people. And of those, 779 of them did the Soviet Union, and one person did the rest of the world and China. Um, now we're in a world where I've never seen a world like this. And I, I'm pretty sure that everyone that sits in my chair says this about their time, but I, um, it is so fraught. It is so complex. It is so dynamic. Um, the digital interconnectedness of the world and the ubiquitous of technology is really making it that everyone has almost access to everything. And so now if you put that in the context of the big threats, which I would say are China, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea, counterterrorism, um, transnational organized crime. And, and if I were sitting here 10 years ago, I would have said those same words, right? But they're very different in their nature. So Russia is not um, just a huge monolith. If you look at what they're doing, they're getting incredibly brazen in terms of their activities, both in weaponization and what they're doing with their cyber, both technical attacks and influence attacks. Um, they're expanding outside their borders. Uh, if you look at their presence in Syria, it really is the establishment of a physical presence that will allow them to project power worldwide in a very different way. China equally is not a monolith, but its expansionism is massively economic. They have a huge weapon investment, but if you look at their Belt and Road Initiative, um, they have a very whole-of-country approach to what they're doing in terms of economic superiority. Um, and if you look at the Russian cyber activities, um, it is very classic Soviet doctrine to disrupt democracy. If you look at China's activities, it's very much about economic dominance. Um, and, and it's just, it, it's so global and it's so ubiquitous. And it is so insinuating in the fabric of the countries, not necessarily illegally, but with a very purposeful intent for them. Iran, um, which you think of regional actors, they've really moved into the space that has been left um, by our successes in counterterrorism and taking away the geography of the ISIS and the Al-Shabaabs and the Al-Nusras. And now you have Iran being almost a stabilizing force, but a stabilizing force that is the largest state sponsor of terrorism and the purveyor of weapons and proxy forces throughout the region in terms of what they're doing. And North Korea, while um, it's an incredibly hopeful sign that we're in the process of negotiating and the fact that there hasn't been a missile test or a nuclear test in over a year, you have to say, is good. You also understand as we go into these that, you, that they are a sovereign nation with intent, um, um, and so you want to be open-minded about it. Counterterrorism is still a real concern, but it's incredibly different in nature um, from what it was on 9-11. Um, we've been really successful in fending things off. I think that is one of the great success stories of the intelligence community after the, the uh, events of 9-11, if you think about the attacks that have been prohibited in terms of scale. But now you have a disparate threat with much smaller signatures, but it doesn't mean it's not present and it doesn't mean it's not impactful in terms of what it does in terms of sowing terrorism. And then transnational organized crime, the opioid crisis in America is a perfect um, instantiation of the importance of that as a national security issue. Uh, I don't know that I have this quite right, um, but uh, the equivalent of a plane going down every day is the number of lives being lost in America to the opioid crisis. Now think about seeing that on TV, when, if there were a plane crash and it would just be huge news, that happening every day in terms of numbers of deaths. So a huge national security interest. 
And then you, I haven't talked about cyber as much because now we're coming to the capability is so pervasive that it is the means by which every as aspect of national interest can be affected. So now anyone's can have greater reach or higher aspiration or ability to cross boundaries of society that we constructed that we thought we understood and now it's challenging those. And those are just a few of them. So it's the dynamism of it and it's the interconnectedness and how do you see, because intelligence is fundamentally about clarity and insight, the ability to know the truth, see beyond the horizon and allow leaders to act before events dictate. This is a world of how do you paint that picture with sufficient clarity that decisions can be made. But other than that, easy day. <laughs> Other than that, we're fine. <laughs> so yeah. I, I want to come back to this question of how do you paint it, but could I ask you first, do these actors learn from each other? China, Russia, Iran, North yeah. Korea. Um, so I, I, I think absolutely, going back to the digital connectedness, um, information just flows so quickly and expertise can be shared um, in ways that just enable that. A lot of those actors have shared interests, right? And, it, and, and not just um, anti the United States, although if you think about it, each one of those that we mentioned has a very counter the United States strategy, so they are natural allies uh, in some way. If you think about Russia and China in a world where they're looking at the potential reunification of the Korean Peninsula, they are going to have shared interests about that. So they're going to want to come uh, together and look about it. So I think, I think it is absolutely true that um, some of these, um, if you want to call them online actors, or if you just want to talk uh, about great powers, um, they have the ability to join forces and it's situational. So you see activities, um, everyone wants to learn to command data. So you see China and Russia getting together from a research perspective on what they're doing in supercomputing. Um, so it's not only regional interests aligning, but it's also scientific interests aligning. And it's all enabled by a world that is increasingly transparent in terms of the flow of information. How much do you worry about all the time? Uh, Wait. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, yes. How much do you worry about another Pearl Harbor? And I'm not referring here necessarily to a uh, September 11th, but actually to a nation state or group of nation states attacking in some way. And maybe part of that question is, and how? Um. So I think you do. I. Uh, if, if I were to just characterize the world in general, it's an interesting moment where there's a certain wait and seeness going on almost internationally about how some things are going to work out and, and uncertainty about who's going to do what. So in, in a weird sort of way, you see activities, but you also see not the desperate activities going on. You see a wait and see. But there is this vibration that's happening. It's like everyone's trying to decide how much they need to protect themselves. And so even though we have relative calm, you actually see the increase of capability. And the more people that have capability, the more likely something is to happen that's a miscalculation. Um, in my world, we talk about the good old spy versus spy days, you know, the genteel days in Vienna where everyone kind of knew what game was being played. And so the actors understood each other. Now you have so many actors with so many interests with not equivalent capability to be able to see the consequences in the discipline. And you worry about most about miscalculation. Some activity that happens that sets something off. If you're following the South China Sea, right? Some activity in the South China Sea that is just a freedom of navigation action but it turns into people playing a much more interesting game. So I just think the increasing capability of the world, the number of players that have interests without necessarily the foundation, whether it's a diplomatic foundation or an intelligence foundation to be able to net it out, I think I worry most about miscalculation 
because there's so much capability worldwide. Uh, in in You've talked in other venues about this wonderful analogy of a jigsaw puzzle uh -huh. and intelligence. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that works. And you're just describing something where around the world people are looking at different jigsaw right. puzzles. How many dimensions are we dealing with at this point? No. So the jigsaw puzzle analogy I usually use is I do a test to see whether you all want to be intelligence officers. You want to play with me? Okay, here we go. Um, do you like jig doing jigsaw puzzles? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Lots of potential intelligence officers in the room already. I'm, I'm feeling safer by the moment. Um, now, of the people that like doing jigsaw puzzles, who likes doing it if you don't know what the picture is? Awesome. Yay, we're still there. You only have a quarter of the pieces. <laughs> I'll take your name at the end. Um, you, uh, I love it. That's awesome. How am I doing on it, Ron? So far, haven't made a mistake with you? Okay. All right, I like it. You're good. Okay, here we go. One more. Um, jigsaw puzzle, no picture, quarter of the pieces. You need to advise the president on what to do in five minutes. Right? But it's an interesting thing because it's a profession of uncertainty. More than uncertainty, you know that your judgment could change with one additional piece of information, but still holding it is not its value, using it it's its value, and so I think that's what it is, and that's the world, right? Um, what Claudia asked me before is, could I think um, of a time where that's really the moment you're in? My, I go, the past year with North Korea is a perfect example of that. Um, you, you know the topic, our ability to see the whole picture, and the whole picture is not just um, the capabilities that you see, it's the understanding of the intent of the equation. And Kim Jong-un is not his father or his grandfather. But how does it work with his government? If you take the conversation we're having in the nation right now about the difference between political and civil servant, and you're playing it in North Korea where you have seen a whole history, where you only see a part of the surface, where you still want to do something, you have an opening. How do you both prosecute it and protect yourself at the same time? That's what intelligence officers are driven every day to close the gap. Decisions are made here. You don't want to leave them off here with intelligence and the whole business is to try and close that gap that you're getting what you provide closer to the decision they have to make. And it's almost every day. And when you hear about intelligence failures, it usually is that we knew that something was possible. But you, and you, we knew the conditions existed. But did you know the um, mindset that would cause the event to actually turn? And so I think what's, what is interesting, to me it satisfies my need, my, my fundamental curiosity, but I think it is a gap in understanding about what intelligence is, is if it weren't uncertain, it wouldn't be intelligence. It would just be straight knowledge. But if it's just knowledge, it isn't forward-looking enough to be valuable for decision-making. And so how do you have enough confidence in the craft? And then how did the policymakers have enough confidence in what you're saying to be able to make it? You've talked uh, also about time and space and maps. I wonder if you could tell us about that and the president and how this is useful. Oh, well, wow, that was, a, that was <laughs> like this great complex question. I'll see if I can do the... Job. Yeah, spatial yeah, intelligence. I so uh, I was a happy CIA officer, um, which is just, it was such a great career. It's one of the great organizations in terms of ethos. We, in general, have a pretty good impression, um, uh, a brand with the, the American people, notwithstanding you know, some, some events. I think we are a respected organization. 
Um, we are very clear about our mission, which is keeping America safe for democracy. So it was a great organization. Um, and then, and, and if you're at the CIA um, during my time, you didn't really think there was anything other, anything else that was necessary. Central Intelligence Agency was just fantastic. 9-11 happened and the intelligence community was formed because we figured out that just like in 1947 when the CIA was formed, there was some question about whether we had all the intelligence in one place. 9-11 asked the same question, so the intelligence community really was born to integrate across all the agencies in the National Security Agency. Still, I had no interest. I was happy in the CIA, and then I got the opportunity to be the deputy director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So think um, maps and images, right? So Bay of Pigs, the image piece, maps, every plane that flies, every ship that sails, um, does so with the benefit of NGA um, navigational aids. Um, what I learned when I was there is that a geospatial reference is remarkable for understanding any issue. So one, it's great to be able to show what's happening. Um, and for this president, Man, when we go in with a map or an image, it is a great day because it's just incontrovertible. But what's even a better day is when you can put any issue in the context of time and space. There's a great law of geography that says everything is related to everything, but things that are near are more so. So now think about putting any image in a geographic or temporal framework. You're going to be able to understand it better. Um, the, the president um, is, um, and he has a penchant for action. And um, intelligence put geospatially is really useful to him because he's trying to see how to do something, not just think something. So it's a, he's, a, he's an interesting president to brief in that regard. In intelligence as it now stands, mm -hmm with all the computers and the abilities yep. and the big data and so on, what is the role of intuition and judgment? Where does that come into it? Uh, how do you find your way through? I, I think you've also yeah. mentioned, you, it used to be that you would hunt for information. Right. Now you're overwhelmed with we it. We are. How do you? Um, so I don't know. Uh, intelligence analysis is, is in some way magical because it's your ability to see um, patterns and, and sometimes um, anomalies. Uh, you know, what I usually say is something that occurs once, never, or always. Those are the things that tend to be the great foundation of intelligence assessment. If you think about a world that's now available to us in terms of all the information, um, what humans can do is ask questions, right? But what machines can do is to find correlations that are just too disparate, too hidden for humans to be able to find on their own. So the combination of humans and the question asking and compute, which can find patterns that are too either big or too um, temporally distant to be able to find them. Um, there's a great book called uh, Signal, Signal and the Noise by Nate Silver. Um, he's, a, he's a big guy into predictions, and so it was really talking about prediction in a big data world. And he said, without a story, noise can look like data. And I think what, I know, think about that. Um, and, and if you put that in context of your question, that's, I think, the perfect uh, thought about you need humans because humans can make a story of why. I wonder, could this be, how could they go together? But there are a lot of data out there that can be organized in a way to show things that are a little elusive, just if you're trying to parse through it the way we deal with data right now. Um, I want to just say to everybody at this point, we would love to get some questions. So if you want to write any questions down and pass them to the end of the aisle, we'll be collecting anything shortly. Please, please do. Um, and uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about your own personal experience with this. Um, you raised two children, 
while doing all this, how did you manage that? <laughs> um, I married a saint. Um, uh, you know, I, I met my husband at Duke, um, and I was smart enough to say yes. Um, so we've been great partners for for almost forty years now. Um, I, you know, if you were my age. Um, uh, you came out of college thinking the world was your oyster, and you were, you were now the generation that could do anything and expected to go into the business world. And I, I remember when I got married early, all my friends were like, oh, we're so disappointed in you. Well, then I did the second thing. I had kids early. Um, the first one was okay. Um, you know, I could manage work. Um, and then my second, I found I was pregnant with my second on the day I got my first management job. And I almost left um, because I thought, oh, you know, I don't know that I can be a mom of two and be a manager. And I made the single best decision I've ever made, and I've used this for the rest of my life, and that is don't decide ahead of time what you can't do. Um, so I just um, was a totally devoted mom. I'm in love with my children. I don't just love them. I'm in love with my children. Um, and I loved what I did. And you know, I'd, I'd drop my kids off at school, I'd work, I'd come home, do their homework with them, snuggle, sing a song, put them in bed, and then I'd go back to work and work for four more hours when they didn't know I was doing it cause, to satisfy both. And that worked great um, for <laughs> about 14 years. Um, and then one day I was working late, my husband was on a business trip because he also uh, worked for the CIA, and I got a call from my nine-year-old daughter who told me my 13-year-old son had run away. Uh, awful, right? And uh, I ended my business meeting. I got home, and luckily my, my son uh, had come back home. Jay will always come back home. And, uh, but I read the letter he wrote, um, and he said, uh, Mom and Dad, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm letting you down. I know... Uh, what the right thing to do is, um, but I got an 89 on a math test and I shouldn't have. He didn't even know that 85 was my standard. Um, but what I saw in this letter was a kid that was assessing the situation wrong, right? He didn't understand that um, he was taking too much burden on himself, so I gave two weeks notice and I quit because um, I'm an in or out gal and I couldn't both be great at my work the way I didn't wanted to do it and great at being a mom, so I thought, I gotta be a mom. And so I spent years, um, seven years, uh, finishing raising my children, deploying them on this very successful life. Uh, and then I looked around, I'm like, well, I, I'm not done. So I saw the director of HR in Wegmans, and I said, hey, are you guys hiring uh, at the CIA? And I came back. My kids are awesome, if you met them, Having now met me, um, you would know them immediately. So for all those people who worry that when you commit to a career, you're somehow giving up some sort of connection or some sort of investment in your children, they're not. They're, they're, they're going to be yours. My daughter is a marine pilot, married to a marine, marine pilot. And my, uh, <laughs> and my son is a former marine who's now um, a dis assistant district attorney in Houston. Uh, married to an assistant district attorney in Houston, so that's weird that they're married to the same thing. But uh, I, I, I can't believe that I got to do it all. And so what I would tell people is it will come to a point where you have to make choices, um, but if you make those choices confidently, if you don't ask for a quarter when you do so, I didn't, when I left the CIA, I didn't say, hey, can you keep my job for me? And I didn't ask him if I could come back at some point. Would you promote me or anything else? I just, I have to do this. And so then I, when I went to come back, they let me. And my kids, um, uh, I think they're proud of the fact that their mom has always been on her way, right? So it's an interesting, but I attribute it all to my husband. He's a great guy. Well, I... Uh, while we could um, get the questions on index cards, we're going to go to those. Let me ask you uh, one more question, we'll which do the is speed round. I'll answer in a tweet. Exactly. We're gonna... <laughs> Actually, um, I do have one more thing I wanted to just quickly ask you, and that uh, and that is, um, 
the private sector piece yeah. of what you do, because uh -huh. I think you were working on that uh -huh. at the point where your 13-year-old ran away. And how important is Versus the private that. sector right ah, now? In... So the private sector is, I, I can't think of any accomplishment of this nation over the course of my career that has been accomplished without the private sector um, being a partner. Now, the nature of our partnership um, has changed as times have changed. Um, and uh, it used to be the government asking the private sector to give us things. I mean, we'd pay for it, but it was to give it. Now you have to have more shared interest and common purpose, right? You have to consider the private sector's value proposition. I think you see this right now with uh, cybersecurity, where we recognize that our adversaries would attack the United States' interests by attacking the private sector, whether for economic espionage or for um, intellectual property or for uh, putting our infrastructure at risk. Well, how does the how does the government best protect them and give them information so that they can use it to protect themselves? And then how do they share with the government what they know about what they're experiencing so we can be much wiser about the nature of the threat? And the only way you can do that is if you understand what each side has to gain and lose. So I think we're seeing um, a, a new era of partnership with the private sector that is really um, based on this notion that, that they are part of national security. And we have an obligation to share with them more of the knowledge that we have. But there's a responsibility that they have to understand that they bear as being part of this nation's infrastructure. You saw a little bit in terms of Mark Zuckerberg um, and Facebook, where in the face of Russian influence, I think some of the social media companies recognized that they had been vehicles for influence. And now you see them doing some really great stuff in terms of protecting themselves and even alerting to what's going on. So I just think you see a really interesting growth in that. But it's hard because we're so different in terms of the way we approach things. And, and so our solution to the private sector is going to be shared value proposition, I believe. Um, that leads right into one of the questions. I'm seeing a lot of interest here in questions about uh, foreign meddling in mm -hmm. elections, sure. um, if you're okay with. Uh, and here's one. To what extent is the intelligence community concerned about meddling in the direct aftermath of the upcoming election? Um, or if you want to no, do the part before, or any part, yeah, basically. Yeah, no. So, and, so listen, it, election security is so important. It is the foundation of this nation, and our adversaries certainly understand that. Um, and so either threatening the ability of each person's vote to count or making us lose confidence in who we are, those are both really bad outcomes. They're about really the only way that you can threaten the United States is to make us not not believe. So this is a really important topic. It's one of the reasons why we put out an unclassified intelligence community assessment because open societies, when presented with information that influence is happening, actually know how to protect themselves pretty well. We're feeling pretty good on protection of the actual election infrastructure. Uh, we've done really good work with um, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and state and local in order to be able to um, take care of the actual mechanisms. This notion of influence, though, and that we understand that this is a vector that our adversaries would want to pursue, I think this is something that we're just going to have to keep working on together. I don't, I don't think it's a matter of getting through this election and then phew, it's going to be okay. I think this is just going to be, have to be something that we continue to work. But this is a whole of nation kind of response. Um, so I feel good about how we're organizing. Um, but this is a tough nut. Um, and I think that's why you're hearing so much about it. 
not because we don't have confidence that we can protect it, but because it's going to require vigilance and require vigilance at a lot of levels that not didn't necessarily have to have it or didn't perceive they had to have it at some point. Uh, sort of along on the cyber front, uh -huh. that's the popular topic here today. I love it. It's, the, I the love cyber it. I love front. this topic. And this is China again. Yeah. As far as China's efforts to control the Internet in China mm -hmm. and uh, this question, I'm, the PRC has proven that the Internet can be controlled. Can this be uncontrolled? Now, I'm not sure whether that means can we meddle in China or... Uh, to uncontrol it or whether it means can we stop this generally, but basically given the enormous extent of what China has been yeah. doing on all fronts, yeah. uh, how do we approach this? What do we do about that? Uh, so I think one of the... Um, or if there's a better way to put the question, no, maybe. No, it's a, it's a good... What, uh, so what I'm tools gonna do we have? Right. Um, so the, the, the best tool we have are international standards and open societies. Um, um, there's a lot of, of talk when you think about um, uh, people, uh, China sending a lot of people to our universities. And while I would say that there's some risk to that, that they could take intellectual property, I mean intellectual advance and go back, I also think that exposing people to free thought, open thought, um, is the number one thing the United States exports that is the best protection um, against totalitarian regimes is the benefits of non-totalitarian regimes um, are really obvious when people participate. So number one is being who we are, which is why there's a, a reaction that you want to clamp down on things. The truth is um, we have a great home field advantage in terms of the way we do things and you want to keep that open. In terms of China trying to clamp down on it, there, there is, um, it is so different there in terms of what China wants to do in order to be able to see, understand, and control its population. And, and the one thing I would say, and this would probably be to my um, um, industry partners, um, there is a reticence of some industry partners to work with the U.S. government. I get it. You know, we're a revolutionary people. We don't, we don't want to be controlled. We don't want Big Brother. and We don't want that. To, I, I understand. If you made me choose between national security and privacy, I would probably choose privacy and work every day so you didn't have to choose. But the notion that some of our companies would choose not to deal with the United States but go and deal with China, search firms, internet firms, I'm just like, what? I, you know, huh? There's an imperfection there. So I, so I think that um, there are, it is not our way to try and control anyone's um, thinking how, um, there's a big difference between the kinds of things the United States does and the kinds of things that some of our adversaries do in terms of trying to control democratic thought, democratic ideas, it's just not what we do. And so if you're asking would we go in to try and change what China does, that isn't typically what we do, but we do should argue for international norms where information is free, where people can have their privacy, and that those intent to control others is not a good way to go. Okay, I'm going to do one more question okay. here and then wrap it up with yes, one for you. And here we have, uh, has the effort to break intelligence silos been overwhelmed by the explosion of data. Uh, maybe you can explain to our audience what that means exactly, <laughs> and as well as what are, what are we discussing That's here? That's a great question. So intelligence silos, so uh, if you think about the 16 agencies of the intelligence community, you have the geospatial intelligence agency that does pictures and maps. You have the national security agency that does signals intelligence. You have the central intelligence agency that has human intelligence. You have um, the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency that does military intelligence, and those can appear to be silos. What we've been doing for the past 14 years is trying to break down those silos by creating common infrastructure that allows data to be shared. And I think we've made huge gains in that. I think what happens over time is the distinction between those different data types becomes increasingly anachronistic 
um, the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, I'm going to steal his line, he said, there's a huge difference between SIGINT and IMINT. IMINT is ones and zeros, and SIGINT is zeros and ones. So what's really interesting about this world of data is there are different types of it, but we're now moving to try and share it, and I think we've made great headway, and I think that's the way forward. You break down barriers when people who need to solve problems can get to all the data they need. Thank you so much. Okay, and finally, I know we have some people, young people in the audience and out there who are wondering, should they go into a career in intelligence? And I wanted to just ask you, pros, cons, what's your advice? Uh, what, do you, what has it really done that's gratifying in your life? Sure. And what is the kind of thing so, to watch out for? Yeah, so here are the pros. Um, uh, one, if you're like me, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm genetically disposed to be a public servant, so it satisfies my need to serve my turn um, and to give something to the cause. So if that satisfies you, this is a good one. I've been here 38 years. I've never been bored a day. So if you just like intellectual curiosity, um, that's for you too. Um, uh, my experience is uh, with my peers that went into the private sector uh, work in uh, the government or national security, you tend to get more responsibility earlier. And you do things of great purpose, um, typically that don't know how to be done. And because if anyone knew how to do it, it would be being done. So those are all great things. Plus, and I don't think we talk about this enough. I, it's a really interesting conversation of, uh, that's in vogue about some of my children's peers that say, how can you work for the government, right? Because with politics, it doesn't, and there's a big difference between the government and politics, but how can you do this? And I say everyone that works in this field takes an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. That is no small thing. Um, so being around a group of people who are predicated on that notion is pretty awesome. Here are the things to watch out for. You can't ever think that we're the point, right? The point of this work is to do something for the American people. It is an incredible responsibility. Um, you didn't ask me what I worry about. What do you worry about? Um, <laughs> and I think this is probably true of most people on the field. I worry about, I, I worried about, about not being worthy of the moment, of the, of the answer being available and we didn't, we didn't find it, or we missed um, something that would make a difference. Uh, it isn't a glib profession when you're in national security. This notion of keeping American sa America safe and Americans safe is a, is a big deal, and you have to remember that's what you're doing. You aren't writing a report. You aren't trying to get promoted. And so I think anytime you get into a big bureaucracy, you can start thinking that, that, that the activity is the point. No, the point is being good enough for the nation. Um, and so just when you listen to my siren call about the joys of doing it, once you join it, don't forget that the job isn't the point. The people are the point. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. It's been a great honor to oh, have yeah. you here. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very, very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely.